Hello, and welcome back to the Prentice Hall Biology Textbook. Today we'll be covering Chapter 15, Darwin's Theory of Evolution. Okay, 15-1, The Puzzle of Life's Diversity. So first, evolution. Evolution is the process by which modern organisms have descended from ancient organisms. And evolution is a theory. It's the theory of evolution. And a theory is a well-supported, testable explanation of phenomena that have occurred in the natural world. Okay, to start off, Voyage of the Beagle. So, Charles Darwin has contributed more to our understanding of evolution than anyone else. And in 1831, he set sail on the HMS Be Beagle for a voyage around the world. During his travels, Darwin made numerous observations and collected evidence about tortoises, finches, and many other animals he, s he saw. Uh, with these observations, he uh, led, a, led him to a propose a revolutionary hypothesis about the way life changes over time. That hypothesis, now supported by a huge body of evidence, has become the theory of evolution. Okay, Darwin's observations. So, Darwin knew a great deal about the plants and animals of his native country, but he saw far more diversity during his travels. So, patterns of diversity. So, Darwin was intrigued by the fact that so many plants and animals seemed to be remarkably well suited to whatever environment they inhabited. He was impressed by the many ways in which organisms survived and produced offspring. And Darwin wondered if there was a process that led to such a variety of ways of reproducing. Okay, living organisms and fossils. So, Darwin realized that living animals represented just a part of the puzzle posed by the natural world. More pieces of the puzzle could be uncovered through fossils, which are preserved remains of ancient organisms. So, Darwin's trip took him to the Galapagos Islands, these islands over here. And now, on the, Gal the Galapagos Islands have very different climates on, this, on small little islands. And Darwin was fascinated in particular by the land tortoises and the marine iguanas he saw. So, he learned that the giant tortoise varied in predictable ways from one island to another. In fact, the shape of a shell could be used to identify which island a particular tortoise had come from. And when Darwin was at the Galapagos Islands, he collected specimens of birds and noticed that they had differently shaped beaks on different islands. Okay, now the journey home, his trip back from the Galapagos Islands. So Darwin observed that many of the characteristics of many animals and plants varied noticeably among the different islands of the Galapagos. And he began to wonder if animals living on different islands had once been members of the same species. This meant that these separate species would have evolved from the original South American ancestor species after becoming isolated on the different islands from one another. Okay, 15-2. Ideas that shaped Darwin's thinking. So Earth is ancient and always changing. So James Hutton and Charles Lyell helped scientists recognize that Earth is many millions of years old and that processes that changed Earth in the past are some of the same processes that operate in the present. So Hutton and geological change. So in 1785, uh, James Hutton proposed that Earth is shaped by geological forces that took place over extremely long periods of time, and Earth may be millions, not thousands of years old. So he proposed that layers of rock form very slowly. Also, some rocks are forced up by forces beneath Earth's surface, while others are buried, and still others are pushed up from the sea floor to form mountain ranges. The resulting rocks, mountains, and valleys are then shaped by a variety of natural forces. Then we have Lyell's Principles of Geology, which uh, were published in 1833. So his work explained how awesome geological features could be built up or torn down over long periods of time. And he explained that these processes had been uh, shaping Earth's surface for very long periods of time. So this understanding of geology influenced uh, Darwin in two ways. If the Earth could change over time, uh, life then could change as well. And Darwin realized that it would have taken many years for life to change in the way he suggested. Next we have Lamarck's evolution uh, hypothesis. So this was published in 1809, and he published his theory on the inheritance of acquired traits. And although his theory is flawed, he was one of the first to propose a mechanism explaining how organisms change over time. So he proposed that by selective use or disuse of organis organi organs, organisms acquired or lost certain traits during their lifetime, and these traits could then be passed on to their offspring. Over time, this process led to a change in species. So he had three main points, tendency towards perfection, use and disuse, and inherited of, inheritance of acquired traits. 
Okay, so tendency toward perfection. So Lamarck proposed that all organisms have an innate tendency towards complexity and perfection. And as a result, they are continually changing and acquiring features that help them live more successfully in their environments. Next, use and disuse. So use and disuse. Because of this tendency towards perfection, Lamarck proposed that organisms could alter the size or shape of particular organs by using their bodies in new ways. And then we have inheritance of acquired traits. So Lamarck believed that offspring could inherit traits acquired by parents during their lifetime. So now let's evaluate Lamarck's hypothesis. So he did not know how traits were inherited, but, um, and he also did not know that an organism's behavior had no effect on its heritable characteristics. It doesn't matter what an organism does in its lifetime, that will not affect its, uh, its inher the uh, inheritance of those uh, traits. And then, however, he was one of the first to develop a scientific hypothesis of evolution and to realize that organisms are adapted to their environment. Okay, another idea that shaped Darwin's thinking. So, population growth. In 1798, it, um, Thomas Malthus published a book in which he noted that babies were being born faster than people were dying. And Malthus re reasoned that if the human population continued to grow unchecked, sooner or later there would be insufficient living space and food for everyone. And he observed that the only forces that worked against this population growth were war, famine, and disease. Darwin realized that this reasoning applied even more strongly to plants and animals. Because humans produce far fewer offsprings than most species, he summarized that most offspring of animals must die. Okay. 15-3. Darwin presents his case. So the pub so all the publication of On the Origin of Species, his hypothesis, was not published until uh, 1859. And this was after he received an essay from Alfred Russell Wallace, a fellow naturalist who had been doing field work in Malaysia. So Wallace's essay summarized the thoughts on evolutionary change that Darwin had been mulling on over for over 25 years. So soon after he received this essay, Darwin published uh, On the Origin of Species. Okay, and next, one of, another uh, aspect of Darwin's case. Inherited variation and, artif and artificial selection. So one of Darwin's most important insights was that members of each species vary from one another in important ways. And variation exis existed in nature and on farms. So variations were very important because they often could lead to beneficial traits. And in artificial selection, nature provided the variation and the humans selected those variations they found useful. An example of this is usually the largest and strongest bull is used to breed with the cows to produce the largest and strongest offspring. So artificial selection has produced many diverse domestic animals and crop plants. Next, we have evolution by natural selection. So this was Darwin's greatest contribution, and this centered around the struggle for existence. Darwin realized that high birth rates and a shortage of life's basic needs would eventually force organisms into a competition for resources. And the struggle for existence means that members of each species compete to regularly obtain food, living space, and other necessities of life. In this particular struggle, the predators that are faster or have a particular way of ensnaring other organisms can catch more prey. And the prey that's faster, better camouflaged, or better protected can avoid being caught. So those are the ones that can survive and reproduce. Now Darwin called this the survival of the fittest. And a key factor in the struggle for existence was how well suited an organism is to its environment. And fitness is defined as the ability of an individual to survive and reproduce in its specific environment. And Darwin proposed that fitness is a result of adaptations, and an adaptation is any inherited characteristic that increases an organism's chance of survival. So adaptations can be anatomical or structural, and they can also include an organism's psychological process. So individuals with low levels of fitness who are not suited to their environment die off, while individuals with high levels of fitness survive and reproduce. And then the differential survival and reproduction came to be known as survival of the fittest. Darwin called it natural selection. Over time, natural selection results in changes in the inherited characteristics of a population. And these in changes increase a species' fitness in its environment. Next, we have descent with modification. So descent with modification. Darwin proposed that over time, natural selection produces organisms that have different structures, establish different niches, 
or occupy different habitats. As a result, species today look different from their ancestors, and each living species has descended with changes from other species over time. And this principle is referred to as descent with modification, and it implies that all li living organisms are related to one another through an ancient ancestor. And common descent. So all species, living and extinct, were derived from common ancestors. Okay. Next, we have evidence of evolution. This, so this is Darwin's evidence of evolution. Darwin argued that living things have been evolving for Earth on, for, on Earth for millions of years. Evidence for this process could be found in the fossil record, the geographical distribution of living species, homologous structures of living organisms, such as these over here, here and similarities in early development, or embryology. So the fossil record. Darwin saw fossils as a record of the history of life on Earth, and you, by using fossils, he could note similarities between ancient animals and uh, modern ones. Okay, geographical distribution of living species. So, Darwin decided that the birds on the Galapagos Islands, the Fitches, finches, had descended with modification from a common mainland ancestor, and that the species now living on different continents had each descended from different ancestors. However, because some animals on each continent were living under similar conditions, they were exposed to similar pressures of natural selection. And because of these pressures, different animals ended up evolving certain striking features in common. Okay, next we have the homologous uh, body structure, as we can see here. So by Darwin's time, researching, researchers had noticed striking anatomical similarities among the body parts of animals with backbones. So for instance, the limbs of reptiles, uh, the wings of birds, and then limbs of mammals. We can see here all, that each of these specific uh, limbs has the same bones, bones in each one. Okay, and so these structures that have different mature forms but develop from the same embryonic tissues are, call, are called homologous structures. And this provides evidence that all four-limbed vertebrae uh, have descended with modification from common ancestors. And the similarities and differences help biologists group uh, animals according to how they recent how recently they shared a common ancestor. Next, there are uh, vestigial organs, which are vestiges or traces of homologous organs, and these may resemble miniature legs, tails, or other structures. And one possibility that they exist is that the presence of a, a vestigial organ may not affect an organism's ability to survive and reproduce, so the body does not get rid of it. Next, we have uh, similarities in embryology for the last piece of evidence of evolution. And it is clear, th clear that in the same groups of embryonic cells, that same, the same groups of embryonic cells develop in the same order and in similar patterns to produce the tissues and organs of all vertebrae. Okay, now we have the summary of Darwin's theory. So, first, individual organisms differ and some of this variation is heritable. Organisms produce more offspring than can survive, and many that do survive do not reproduce. So because more organisms are produced than can survive, they must compete for limited resources. Okay, and then each unique organism has different advantages and disadvantages in the struggle for existence. Individuals best suited to their environment survive and reproduce most successfully, and these organisms pass their heritable traits to their offspring. Uh, through natural selection. And then species alive today are descended with modification from their ancestral species. This process by which diverse species evolved from common ancestors unites all organisms on earth into a single tree of life. Okay, key concepts. What did Darwin's travels reveal to him about the number and variety of living species? How did tortoises and birds differ among the islands of the Galapagos? Uh, what two ideas from geology were important to Darwin's thinking? And then, according to Lamarck, how did organisms acquire traits? According to Malthus, what factors limited population growth? How is artificial selection dependent on variation in nature? And the theory of evolution by natural selection explains how living things evolve over time. What is being selected in this process? Okay, that's it for chapter 15.